Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. A world where coming in second place is not an option, but where principled-centered winning is the only approach. Good morning and welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. I'm Jim McCarthy, the owner of Key Solutions and the host of the show. As you know, it's not unusual to pick up a paper or watch the evening news or listen to a debate on Capitol Hill and hear the almost constant refrain surrounding the security of our borders. Further complicating this situation is the very real concern that some of the people who are bent on harming our country are equipped with sophisticated technology which we can only combat by staying one step ahead with our own technology through continuous innovation. Now joining me today to discuss this vital issue is Mark Borkowski, the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Technology Innovation and Acquisition with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection for the Department of Homeland Security. We have a fascinating and critical discussion for you today, so let's get right to it. Mark S. Porkowski, Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Technology Innovation and Acquisition with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection for the Department of Homeland Security. Prior experience included Executive Director of both the Secure Border Initiative and Mission Support at Headquarters, United States Border Patrol. Prior to CBP, Mark Borkowski was a program executive for the Robotic Lunar Exploration Program at NASA Headquarters, as well as overseeing the Hubble Space Telescope Robotic Servicing. Mr. Borkowski served over 23 years on active duty in the United States Air Force, retiring with the rank of Colonel. Mr. Borkowski holds a master's degree in astronomical engineering from the Air Force Institute of Technology, as well as in National Resource Strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. He also earned other degrees from both AFIT and the State University of New York at Albany. Mark Borkowski, welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. It's good to be here. Glad to have you here, Mark. We've had a number of your colleagues on the show, yes. by the way. Mm -hmm. They've raised a bar pretty high, but I know you're going to get over <laughs> okay. it, right? Okay, right, good. We'll so the first question is, tell us about OTIA. Tell us about the mission. Well, the Office of Technology Innovation and Acquisition is a relatively new part of Customs and Border Protection. Uh, it was established based on some lessons learned we had had about acquisition as the Department of Homeland Security actually started to get more into acquisition. And if you look at the civil part of government, you'll have seen a lot of acquisition activity in the IT environment, the information technology environment. But we were buying things that were more like people would recognize that the Department of Defense bought, and we didn't have uh, much of an infrastructure, a capacity, a set of competencies to do that. Mm -hmm. So when I became responsible for a significant acquisition program, one of the first challenges I had actually was educating the community and the leadership on decisions that needed to be made and the factors that went into those decisions. Mm -hmm. That created an awareness in CBP that that was a, a need, a requirement that was more broad than just the program that I had. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, an understanding that this business of managing acquisitions is itself sort of an art, an arcane art. Okay. And so OTIA was established to build some strength and some competency for that within CBP. Okay, we're, we're going to get to the subject of acquisition in just a moment. Let me ask you sort of a basic question, which is, are we safe? In other words, have we stemmed the, the, the tide of illegal immigration in the United States or preventing terrorists from coming, whatever. What's your feeling of that? You know, I think if you ask, if you ask me, do I feel we're safe, I'd mm -hmm. say I feel, I, I feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the question of whether somebody's safe is a personal question, right? Mm -hmm. You can have two people that live in a neighborhood, the same neighborhood, one person feels safe leaving their door unlocked, the other person feels that they need to spend all kinds of money on a high-tech right. uh, surveillance system. So it's a very individualized uh, point of view. But I think if you ask most Americans in general, if you look across the world and where we are, are we safe? I think they would say yes. I think if you ask them, could we be safer? Would you like to be safer? I think they would say yes. How about the tide? Has that been stemmed? Uh, it certainly has been reduced. I think mm -hmm. there's plenty of evidence that it's been reduced. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I would say that the, the tide has been stemmed. And when we talk about that tide in the, in the public domain, we're usually talking about the tide, what we call between the ports of entry, where we put a good deal of focus on security between the ports of entry. But yes, there's plenty of evidence that that's been reduced significantly. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the challenges that you and your office <coughs> face at this point. What are the big ones? Well, there are a couple, um, and I'll talk about some strategic ones to start. Okay. One is, what is the role of, for example, technology in this business? 
You know, if you look at the Department of Defense, which has a whole history with the use of technology, they have a baseline on which to build an analysis of why they want the next thing. Uh -huh. We don't actually have that baseline. So one of our biggest challenges is establishing a baseline and an understanding of what technology brings. And in that environment, it's very important to make sure that we do technology for some reason, for some mission purpose. It's very tempting to buy technology because technology is neat. And so that's one of the big challenges we have. Uh, another challenge that we have is actually the procurement cycle, how long it takes to buy that technology. Very difficult, and that's aggravated by the fact that, as I suggested earlier, we're trying to build a competency in the Department of Homeland Security and in Customs and Border okay. Protection, which means I'm still hiring people. Still and hiring I probably people. don't have the okay, size so that, Those two questions then, is technology up to the task, and is acquisition uh, structure up to the task? In right, your right. Uh, technology does seem to be up to the task. Mm -hmm. Our experience with technology has been very promising where we've had it. Uh, we often get questions about how well can you quantify that, but the fact of the matter is where we put technology in areas to augment personnel, to augment other infrastructure, roads, fences, what we typically find is that there's a sort of an immediate reaction to that technology. We find activity we did not know about, we relatively quickly address it, and then those areas become very quiet. Mm -hmm. The activity ceases. So there's, a, there's at least very qualitative anecdotal evidence that technology is very effective. How about the acquisition side? The acquisition side is more challenging because it takes mm -hmm. so long. So mm -hmm. what we find is that the threat evolves faster than, the, than we can buy the technology to go along with it. Those are kinds of the challenges that the department we are looking at. How so, can we do that more quickly? So are we playing catch up if the threat can evolve quicker than we can respond? Is that playing uh, catch up? It, with respect to technology we're playing catch up, but remember that technology is not the only thing we have. So mm -hmm. you have to understand that this is a combination of resources. It's got, we've got people, for example, Border Patrol agents, Customs and Border Protection officers. The first thing we do, we typically have been able to do, is put people in those places. Technology doesn't get there as quickly as we would like, but remember what technology is doing then is, is coming in and reinforcing and relieving those people. So we always have a capacity to respond fairly quickly. The question is, is that response the right long-term permanent response? We wish, we would like to have a more timely, more responsive acquisition uh, process so we can get closer to the more cost-effective, uh, more long-term balanced approach. Mm -hmm. But it's not that we can't respond. It's that we can't respond with what we think is the optimal mix of things Optimally, like people, okay. technology, and other stuff. Well, stories. we're going to step away for a commercial break, and when we come back, I would like to pursue a little bit about acquisition. So Great. we'll talk about that okay. after this commercial. So did we win that government contract? We did. And? And now we've got to deal with the regulatory hurdles. <laughs> well, good luck with that. When the government's your client, you need to play by their rules. Oh, and the rules change more than you think. Exactly. We need someone who's done this before. Plus, it's complicated, so we're going with BDO. BDO? Hmm. People who know government contracting know BDO. Since 1941, the USO has been lifting the spirits of America's troops and their families. Members of our military continue to make sacrifices and defend our nation. That's why the USO of Metropolitan Washington, Baltimore is committed to serving them throughout their years of service. USO Metro is the way for you to say thanks to our local military members, their families, and our wounded warriors and caregivers. Please visit us at usometro.org. AOC Key Solutions and the Government Technology and Services Coalition are pleased to announce that High Tech Services Incorporated, a federal programs and technology solutions provider, is a 2014 Mentor of the Year award winner. Nominated by AMTIS, High Tech Services has mentored AMTIS in multiple areas, including developing their business space and infrastructure to successfully participate and graduate from the 8A Business Development Program. Making numerous introductions to partners and opportunities for AMTIS and formalizing a mentor-protege relationship with the U.S. Small Business Administration in 2012. On behalf of the Government Technology and Services Coalition and AOC Key Solutions, congratulations to High Tech Services and thank you for paying good mentorship forward. Back now with Mark Borkowski. Mark, the question is, we know it's been tough on the budget side. Mm -hmm. How has that impacted your mission? It actually hasn't impacted my mission at this point. It has impacted how much I can buy. 
We've been focused very much on figuring out what's the right type of technology to do to augment the personnel. We've had a lot of investment in people, we've had a lot of investment in infrastructure, we're trying to catch up with the investment of, te of technology. So we have plans, we have uh, a menu of items that we're buying, and the question is how many of those we can buy. We have aspirations to buy a lot, and we have budget to buy less than that. So it hasn't actually affected a great deal until we get downstream and we start talking about is it time to buy the next increment. That's where the budget affects That's us. That's where we might right. see the effect right. then. Right, Okay, and hopefully by that time the, the, the budget problems will be somehow straight. Well, uh, and the that. other part of that is that we've been told and asked, and it's a reasonable question, Look, before we commit to more, why don't we prove that what we the initial thing worked? And so mm -hmm. th there's a little bit of that dialogue back and forth too. It says buy a little now, prove that it's effective, and then we'll talk about buying some more. Okay, so in terms of acquisition, you you mentioned that there's sort of a, too long of a lead uh, lead time sometimes. But what's the track record been of uh, DHS as a whole or or your office in terms of technology acquisition? How would you view it? I think up to this point it's been fairly checkered. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, we didn't have a great uh, great strength and competency. We didn't have the kind of rigorous analysis that uh, supported the case for acquisition. And we didn't have the, the skilled program managers to deal with complex acquisitions. So it's been sort of checkered. Over the last couple of years, I think it's gotten much better. We've had a couple of programs that have had significant turnarounds. Uh, the automated commercial environment, which is a very significant business process reengineering activity for the trade community, mm -hmm. has turned the corner over the last couple of years because of some of the emphasis we've mm -hmm. put on it. The Arizona Technology Plan, the suite of technologies we're buying for the southwest border, which replaces a formerly uh, attempted and, and largely considered to be failed program called SBINet, that, although delayed, although it took a long time, seems to be just, uh, seems to be looking very successful. So lately, it's been better. I guess is what I would say. What's the What's the future of remotely piloted aircraft uh, drones in in your business? Well, certainly we use them on the border, and we also use them for disaster response, what, what we call national special, uh, security special events, things like the Super Bowl, presidential mm -hmm. inaugurations. We have great experience with them and they're very strong strategic assets. We continue to look at different mixes of sensors on them and what they can bring us. So they're very powerful tools. Uh, going forward, there's a question uh, that we're trying to answer about. There are smaller versions of those, almost more handheld versions. Do those make sense in the, in the environment of securing the border? So we're studying the potential to expand and, our use. And of then those. there's the use of the airspace and all those issues. All those issues with come them. in. You know, we have an office of Air and Marine that is responsible for that. Does a very good job. Has a very good relationship with mm -hmm. the FAA that works all that and has actually opened up a good deal of the airspace in the areas that we're interested. Okay. How about in the? We we, we hear a lot about uh, airports and so. What about the maritime, you know, the shipping industry? How what? How's your involvement? in uh, technology for that going so far? Well, again, uh, we're very involved in yeah. that. So uh, I mentioned the automated commercial environment, and that's yeah. really the focus uh, of a lot of this. When we talk about the shipping industry, whether it's coming to a seaport, a land port, or an airport, what we're talking about is two things. One is identifying where's a risk in some of those shipments. And that risk can be either due to a threat to the country, it can be intellectual property rights, think mm -hmm. counterfeit. But we're also balancing that against the fact that these that this is important in, in, in our economy and commerce, so we don't want to delay these things. So the technologies that we look at in the, those areas have a couple of characters. One is what we call non-intrusive inspection, the ability to x-ray things rather than having to tear apart whole shipping containers. The other is uh, information technology systems that allow us to do things electronically and virtually without a lot of paper, and also allow us to process algorithms to help us better target and compare risk to low risk. Mm -hmm. That applies in all modes, and that's effectively with the automated commercial do you, environment. Do you think that there'll be a shift to more emphasis on maritime and, and that in the coming years? Um, I think we're focused on all of them. You know, we have three basic kinds of ports, and mm -hmm. we have people who specialize in each of them. We have seaports, we have land ports, we have airports. Yep. I'm not so sure that's right to describe it as a shift one way or the other. We recognize the characteristics of each of those, and we spend time on each of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you spent time on each of those kinds of things, so let's talk about your role in acquisition. Any thoughts or recommendations on what you think the nation should do to improve the technology aspects of our you know, border protection? In terms of the acquisition process, uh, yes, acquisition. in terms of the acquisition, first of all, we've got to we've got to rejuvenate the skills we had, mm -hmm. due to a whole bunch of things, including budget cuts, some uh, attempts at acquisition reform. I think we've lost some of the basic skills of our people. Secondly, we also have to uh, we have to find a better way to encourage innovation and innovative thinking in acquisition. Acquisition is designed largely, at least in my opinion, to prevent corruption, to prevent nepotism. 
but it slows processes. So what we have to do is find a better balancing between that where we can allow people to be innovative and try new things that might be speedier. That's a, that's a very difficult challenge. Those difficult. two things would help. The third thing though is frankly simply to recognize that it is a fact of life that the acquisition process takes a certain amount of time. There are things we can do as we acquire to build flexibilities once we have a contract in place. And we need to be more forward thinking about the fact that we should not be building stagnant contracts. We should be building contracts that have some flexibility okay. to adapt as we go. Well, talking about contracts, we're going to take a break now, but yeah. when we come back, we want to focus on your thoughts on how industry wins business from Great. DHS. Okay. I'm Jim McCarthy, the owner and technical director of AOC Key Solutions, and I invite you to join us and our partner, the Government Technology and Services Coalition, for the 2014 Mentor Awards presentation. The Mentor Awards recognizes exceptional individuals who have contributed to the success of our market by mentoring small businesses to provide the best innovation, professionalism, and expertise to our federal partners. The event takes place on June 12th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. in Arlington, Virginia. It will feature great food and festive cocktails. This is an excellent opportunity for you to network with both industry leaders and top federal government procurement officers. Individual tickets cost $75 or $50 for GTSC members. For more information or to register, go to gtscoalition.com slash mentor awards. I hope to see you there. question for you. Do you lack an overall effective win strategy? Hi, I'm Jim McCarthy, owner of Key Solutions. For over 30 years, KSI has helped clients win or retain over 130 billion in government contracts by providing the keys to winning. Now, if you're chasing a must-win contract, go to our website, aockeysolutions.com, and click on Win. It's a tough market. Don't go it alone. Welcome back. I'm here with Mark Borkowski. Uh, Mark, let's talk about winning business, and let's talk about competition. Tell us about whether, tell us about how committed your agency is to competition and, and to new entrants. Do you really want competition? Do you have enough, and do you need more entrants? Yes, uh, I think we're very committed. I certainly am very committed. Uh, there is a culture that has arisen that thinks that if we can limit competition, we get to a better product more quickly. I don't believe in that. You don't buy that. In fact, the recent competitions that we ran were designed to enhance competition, to increase competition, and the result was we got a significantly larger number of proposals than we expected from a much different demographic. In other words, some of the mid-level people have not played in this arena. So there's something to be said for that, and by the way, in some of these things, we, we uh, generate contract costs that were 25% of my estimate. Uh -huh. So there's big benefit to competition. But doesn't that protract the selection it, it, process? It, it certainly does. It's yeah. a cost of doing business, yeah. but it's a reasonable cost of doing business because it, uh, it extends the, the selection process, but increases the likelihood you get a better product out of that process, and probably, it's hard to prove, but probably shrinks the schedule at the end as you work through all of the headaches that you normally have in an acquisition. You're more likely to have a better product and less time at the tail end. So I think overall it's a good trade. In terms of new entrants, that's very difficult, right? I'm, I'm, we have tried a bunch of different things that encourage and support new entrants. I don't think, personally, that, that these small business set-aside programs work because they're a very small part of the market. What small businesses really want to do is they want to play in the big markets, the big technology markets. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're trying to do is work with small businesses, first of all, to give them a better opportunity to compete on our products. And I'll talk to you about how we've done that if we, get, if we have time to do that. But also, we've been working with a group of industry uh, called the Border Security Technology Consortium, which is an attempt to network that and to use innovative acquisition techniques like other transactional authority to give those folks a little bit better opportunity to really get into the meaty products projects that they really want to get into. Mm -hmm. Well, do small small businesses get a fair shake? You know? I think, you know, 
I think they get a fair shake, but I think they have trouble competing in the traditional way we do acquisition. Mm -hmm. If I go out in an acquisition and I say, I have this rigid set of requirements, and if you can't meet that rigid set of requirements, you can't compete. What we usually find with small and medium businesses is they have something that's pretty close but not all the way. And they don't have the ability to make the capital investment to take them to the next level. Hence teaming or something right, like that. Right, and, and by okay. the way, their big concern with teaming is they're going to get bought out. I mean, I get small businesses in all the time who say, tell me who I can talk to who will team with me and give me a name that isn't somebody's going to try to buy me try out to, to kill me. my idea, right? right? That's what the board of Okay, for. so let's talk about a small business. And so let's say a small business invents a better mousetrap. Right. How would you recommend that they proceed? Well, first of all, business? they should call me directly. I meet with these people all the time. If I'm in town, I have at least one meeting a day with a vendor, and frankly, they're frequently small businesses. Mm -hmm. We then have the capacity to expose that to a broader audience to see how much interest there is in that and to run things like pilots and, and uh, samples. We can also connect them with DHS Science and Technology, which is the part of DHS that has money for those kinds of things to mm -hmm. support those kinds of investments. So first thing they should do is come and talk to us. We'll do a little interactive dialogue and feedback. And if there's enough interest, we have the capacity to do something. Okay. Like so they have this better mousetrap. What are the areas of technology where you're looking for specific better mousetraps or innovation? We're looking for uh, mousetraps in all kinds, just about any area. Mm -hmm. First of all, let me also say this. I'm interested in people telling me about things that I didn't know were potentials. So. Mm -hmm. Those are better mousetraps too. I think sometimes we constrain innovation if you just ask me to tell you what I, I'm interested in. Hey, I hadn't even thought of that, you have an idea. Having said that, sensors, um, uh, the use of mobility, but not just mobility for mo mobility's sake, mobility because it allows me to do a mission enhancement. Um, open, uh, open architectures, data fusion, big data, um, algorithms that help me sort through lo lots of data and do targeting and intelligent analysis, video analytics, I mean, there's a slew of these kinds of things. Uh, modeling and simulation tools that help me trade off, for example, at ports of entry when I have long delays, help me trade off the ways I can mix people and technology to smooth those delays, to eliminate those delays. Whole load of things that we're interested in. So that, that sounds like a pretty good uh, wish list, almost, in right. terms of technology. Right. Is there money? And, and just about right. 30 seconds left, if you could. We have, we have some, mm -hmm. but there's a chicken and egg problem, right? You make the case for money, and then you can, you can go get support for money. So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg. We have money to seed things, to get things started, and we can use that to make cases for money in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, we want to thank you for being here today, and I'd like to extend an invite for you to come back sometime when you we'll have to. And, and maybe you might uh, be able to talk to us about some other subject that you're involved in. We'd love to hear We'd it. love to do that. So we're going to step away now and uh, go to our customary feature that we call the mailbag, and we're going to answer answer some questions from you, uh, the audience. So thanks again, Mark. Thank Appreciate you. It. Appreciate it. As you've seen from watching our show, we've begun to produce and air commercials. For advertisers, this is smart for a couple of reasons. First, there's no waste. Our audience is almost entirely contracting executives and procurement officers. Second, we include commercial production, and with KSI's $130 billion in wins, we know how to create the most impactful message. To learn more, contact us at governmentcontractingweekly.com and click on Advertise. FCA has been bringing government and industry together since 1946. By joining FCA, you will reach the decision makers and become part of the discussion. You'll increase market visibility, gain market insight, receive discounts on FCA member services and events, and manage and engage corporate associates. FCA is the association of choice. Join today at www.fcia.org. The Veteran Institute for Procurement was established to arm our vets to win in the federal marketplace. VIP is a comprehensive educational training program for veteran-owned businesses, and it's working as graduates add jobs and grow revenue. The program is funded entirely by the Montgomery County Chamber Community Foundation and is offered entirely at no cost to participants. To learn more, please visit our website at nationalvip.org. A very common question we hear is, what can a company do to protest-proof its proposals? The short but sad and simple truth is nothing. 
No formula exists to guarantee that a protest can be prevented. But you can take prudent steps to improve your odds should a protest arise. These four suggestions, in part, are courtesy of the law firm of Crowell and Mooring, one of our strategic partners. First, adhere to the solicitation and take no exceptions. Common errors resulting in protests occur because of a failure to follow basic RFP instructions. You must comply with every requirement and not by merely parroting the words back. Remember, an offeror taking exceptions to RFP requirements risks being tossed. Second, prepare an outline and RFP compliance matrix, not just ones based on Section L, M, and C. Subject these artifacts to expert review. Lock them in early and enforce them vigorously. Conduct periodic compliance checks until proposal submission. Third, make proposal evaluation easy for the agency. Whenever possible, follow the same structure, for example, headings, subsection, numbering conventions, and so on, that appears in the RFP. This minimizes the likelihood that evaluators will miss a key pro proposal element. And finally, maintain independence when teaming with large businesses. Small businesses must avoid improper affiliation or control by large businesses. To avoid size standard protests in a small business set aside, small businesses should never front for a large business. These four strategies will strengthen your hand in the event of a protest. For other suggestions, stay tuned to Government Contracting Weekly. And if you have other suggestions that have worked for you, please let us know. While our safety can never be 100% assured, it's comforting to know that leaders like Mark Burkowski are bringing great skill and dedication to the job at hand. It's also worth noting that Mark's responsibilities oversee a tremendous area of opportunity for the contracting community in the service of our national security. So I want to thank Mark Burkowski for joining me today, but most importantly, I want to thank you, our viewers, all over the world for once again making Government Contracting Weekly a regular part of your learning regimen. On behalf of all my colleagues at Key Solutions, I'm Jim McCarthy, and I'll see you next week. You've been watching Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored each week by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. For additional information, comments, questions, or suggestions, please write us at governmentcontractingweekly.com.